Hey, what's up, dude? How do? It does. Starting my vacation off with talking to you. Right on. Well, congrats. <laughs> it's been a long time coming, it feels like. <laughs> this vacation's been booked since, like, February. Oh, wow. Just wasn't expecting a hurricane to be so close to where we're going. Yeah, that's kind of not awesome. No. I would imagine with all the traveling you do, though, that you probably have skirted by some, some natural disasters over the years. Um, I think we got stuck in Europe for a while because of a volcano. In Europe? Uh, yeah, because of the flight path. You have to go up by Iceland. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I feel really stupid for being like a typical American, American and being like, are there <laughs> volcanoes in, in Europe that I'm just unaware of? Yeah, no, it was a, it's a <laughs> all flight path related. Okay, that makes a lot more sense. <laughs> yes, it does. Um... I'm going to be, I mean, the couple of podcasts I've checked out that you've done, everyone really likes to go super in-depth and, and like I said, your, your older bands and such, and uh, I'll kind of hit on Shiner a little bit just because of the nature of the fact that you guys are back and actively touring somewhat. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, I mean, it's kind of relevant, but I think it's everything, honestly, I think after after all that that I think has not really been talked about a whole lot, it doesn't seem... So either people don't care, like they only care about that specific time frame, and they're just like, oh yeah, you do some stuff after that, and, and, and here you are uh, doing that thing again, so we'll talk about that. And there's like a whole chunk that I feel like it's like, but there's all this other interesting shit that I feel like you've done since and, and continue to do uh, that no one's really touched on. So I don't know, like I said, if that's just because of the, the demographic of their listeners or just kind of like how people fall in and out of following a certain artist or whatever, but... It's kind of the, the thing I've been really surprised that no one's actually been like, hey, let's talk about these things and, and so forth. Cool. Okay. <laughs> um, awesome. Is there, do you have a hard out by any chance? Uh, no. It? Okay. Um, I don't think it'll take much more than like an hour, hour and a half, typically. Um, so I have the pleasure of talking with uh, Josh Newton of too many bands to fucking mention at once. <laughs> it's true. Um, <laughs> so i kind of like let's kind of hop right in and like let's get a little background on on you and kind of how you got into music and the formation i guess of your your formative years of playing music um starting from literally the very beginning i saw kiss on tv oh wow and i was like oh that's that's what i'm gonna do there was like no question it was Instantly, there was never any other goal. It was like, oh, well, I'm going to play music because that's super interesting to me and nothing else really matters now. <laughs> was it – because, I mean, with Kiss and, and the, the bombastic nature of, like, their live shows and just the, the, the everything that that band does and, and still – is doing despite being on like five farewell tours i think at this point the never but, ending uh, yeah. yeah i saw the first one and i think that was back in like 98 the so. first one was in 95 or 6 okay i know it was like shortly after i moved here to michigan and we saw yeah, them, it was and it was before they started actually putting other people in the original makeup and yeah, shit, so. yeah 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 so i think <laughs> yeah you um, wouldn't know That's yeah you mean. wouldn't know really um but i mean it admittedly i've never been a super big kiss fan but i will say like watching kiss like there's there's so so many different parts to that band that kind of makes you like oh i want to be a bass player because like gene's really commanding and, and has cool bass parts and very iconic yeah. bass parts or there's ace doing you know classic leads and stuff like that that would maybe you want to influence he's trying play guitar. <laughs> <laughs> and then you know paul would, i mean not so much the singing for me or many people i know but i mean or even like peter chris you know like there's there's kind of iconic drum parts and just what he kind does of, with it so i, mean, I will say like, he's what, an awful awful drummer. <laughs> and i mean kiss as a band is they were not, pretty awful in the beginning not a good band like mm -hmm. i don't i don't listen to kiss now like oh yes i was just into the impact that they had and the okay. visual because i never got into sports i never i never cared about any of that stuff or if i did it was it was like individual stuff like you know bmx or skateboarding and stuff like that so i was never i never really had an opportunity to bond with other males and and, and this is very strange way to, <laughs> to start out with the same thing but like, since I was never like a sports dude, the only real bonding I've had with other dudes is people that I play music with. Right. And I think that was, that started early. Like 
I, I always wanted my bands to be like a gang, you know, not necessarily in the sense of we go beat each other bands up, you go beat other bands up. But like, it just appealed to me to like, these are my dudes. This is this thing that we do. I don't know. Actually, it's it's kind of interesting though that you say that, and I've I've often said, I mean, one of my favorite bands uh, from back in the day was Thin Lizzy. Uh, that's mm-hmm. Pretty much what I grew up on, stuff like that. But it's interesting you say that because I've never thought about it until kind of right now. But a lot of bands back then, though, that's kind of the vibe they had. You you kind of felt like they were a gang, and like if anyone got into any shit with one of them, you had you got into shit with all of them. You, yeah, I mean, ACDC certainly came across that way, especially yeah. when Bon Scott was a singer. Yeah, for sure. So I mean, it's kind of interesting you say that. I've never actually thought of. Wanting to be in a band and, and making it kind of a gang, gang-esque kind of thing. And I think it's always interesting when, like, some of the bands actually kind of do stuff like that. Like, we're, I think even, and we're jumping kind of ahead, but I think at one point when you were in Eaton, didn't you guys, like, all wear, like, jean jackets with, like, a back patch on it? And it was kind of, like, There was a thing, well, the thing, that stems from, I've always been obsessed with the movie The Warriors. Right. And... You know, going back to the being a gang theme, but I was pushing for us to do a video where we beat up a bunch of other bands like in the Warriors, like the other right. bands with the other gangs and everybody had their outfits. I was really pushing for that video, but it just never, never really took <laughs> off. I thought it would have been really funny. Like they go up against Dillinger or, you know, whoever. And I mean, we kind of saw that sort of with uh, Soil Work and In Flames when they were in each other's videos, uh, like and they were each performing in the same club in the different videos that they were in, but the other band was like the heckling band. Like, Oh really? Oh, yeah. It was a really interesting thing. That's and a that, good concept. I mean, yeah. That's yeah. And concept. so, I mean, again, it's funny you bring that up. It's, it's a good idea. And I'm always, ever since that video, I've always been like, why don't more bands like kind of do stuff like that with each other and yeah. kind of like cross promote things like that. But again, jumping ahead quite a bit, but, um, <laughs> but no, it's, it's, it's interesting you say that, like that, you know, that's kind of what spurns you to kind of want to maybe start being in a band. What did you actually pick up first, bass or guitar? Guitar. Okay. And I know you do play drums somewhat. I play drums. No, <laughs> I wanted to. Okay. Uh, I'm an awful, 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 extra awful drummer. <laughs> um, but if I could play drums, I don't think I'd play guitar or bass ever again. Really? Um, yeah. If I could be that dude that's hitting the drums, yeah, I don't, it'd be cool. <laughs> um yeah, so a friend, a family friend gave me a guitar knowing that I was fully obsessed with Kiss. And I didn't really bother learning it for a long time as much as I just kind of air guitared with a guitar for a long, long time. <laughs> okay. Until I was about 11 and I started taking lessons. And I took lessons from a guy that just showed off the whole time and super bummed me out. <laughs> I was like paying this dude to do like jerk off solos in front of me, and I would always leave like, I'm not. I didn't learn anything. What did What did I just pay for? <laughs> I had like a one person concert, so um, I stopped going as soon as I learned like the mechanics of basically how to tune the guitar myself. I kind of just did the shitty punk rock like, oh, I know this power chord. See ya. Like, <laughs> I'm starting my own band. Right. And that's kind of. You know, that was around like 14, but it was, I was also dividing my time between like, like I said, BMX and skateboarding. So guitar, I didn't immediately take to it and start practicing a thousand hours a week. You know, I just casually here and there. And then, you know, the the interest with the other things and getting hurt doing other things kind of (laughs) sent me more towards the music. Two questions, I guess, from that. For those who don't know, you're, you're a lefty. Um, Yes. How hard was it to find left-handed instruments back then? Because I, I didn't. I would just flip the strings like, like you would Andrews. do. Yeah, yeah, I was gonna say like a lot of yeah. Because uh, it's it's been kind of weird thinking about different times before certain like you know you you mentioned Hendrix and it's like I'd imagine around that same time maybe like when he was coming out with like signature series maybe they would come out with a handful of left-handeds or whatever but. Mm-hmm. Um, I know the the next big one would be Kurt Cobain, as far as I can think of, as far as like, I mean, a big big scale like that that would change the like kind of landscape of the instrument. That's actually a lot of lefty dudes have done that. Strangely enough, like Paul McCartney, yeah, Tony Iommi. Oh yeah, I forgot about him. I always that's, just remember that he like chopped off his fingertip, and then because of yeah, that, he had to down tune, and yes. that was the birth of that. But, it's it's crazy that like these dudes these lefty dudes, each one of them kind of altered music when they did their thing. 
Yeah. I'm not, and I'm not saying like, Hey, I'm left-handed too. So, you know, <laughs> like, you know, very few people give a shit about what I do, but it's interesting to me that with the exception of like Van Halen, yeah, pretty much all of the other dudes that altered the course of music in their own time or, or, or sort of defined a genre were left-handed. I think that's really strange. Yeah. I, again, that's something I've not really ever thought of until just kind of right now. The, the other question, though, stemming from your, your love of BMX and, and skateboarding and stuff like that, I would imagine around that, that time, that's like when the big, you know, skateboarding videos and, and that kind of subculture were coming through where you're getting a lot of punk bands and, and compilations and stuff like that that are kind totally. of becoming more, more re- prevalent, I guess would be the better term. Did you find that that kind of also fed your your obsession with wanting to play because you, you see something where it's more about an attitude and just kind of the aesthetic that goes along with the the kind of subgenre that you're a part of yeah absolutely and kind of, that, it, yeah and show that it can be done kind of like it was, without being super exactly. technical yeah it was very inclusive and and that gang mentality to, all you need is the thing and you can do this you know? yeah like all you need is a guitar and an amp or a skateboard or a bike and you can fucking go do this now you don't have to be Ingve malmstein <laughs> Although I did try for a bit. <laughs> did you have the scallop frets? No, I never went that far. But I got when I was like fourteen or fifteen, I got seriously obsessed with Steve Vai. And that I would have been practiced. A would lot that have been around the time of either his involvement with Zappa or more in when no, he was, was doing David Lee Roth, like Eat Him and Smile. It was the David Lee Roth thing that that I was like, whoa, this guy's crazy because he was always <laughs> just trying to up Van Halen, one up Van Halen. Yeah, be it with the super obnoxious pink or green guitar, or <laughs> is, I, that, is that why you bought that obnoxious guitar? That, or no, that was a CC Deville, wasn't it? It was a CC, but I've there's a white <laughs> Ibanez is actually making a left-handed Steve Vai now that I'm probably at oh, one point gonna own. That's awesome. At least for a week. <laughs> <laughs> um. So, what were your first couple of like bands like at that point then? Because it seems um, like it was. It's strange because I, you know, I kind of grew up listening to Motley Crue and Poison and weird punk rock stuff at the same time because of my sister. So she was always kind of like playing the exploited or playing stuff where punk rock came from, like the Who. So I I had a very strange combination of like, I can like Tesla Oh, and now so I underrated. sort of like early Megadeth. Like it was a very strange period for me. And I feel like, I'm sorry to cut you that, off. Isn't that around the like, like early 80, like mid 80s though? If I'm kind yeah. of trying to think of like your, your like yeah, so teen I'm like years. 13, I'm like 13, 14, 15. Okay. So yeah. I mean, that's, that's really though, like when a, a lot of genres were like, we're just being mashed together. And, and I mean, you talk about Metallica and Megadeth and stuff like that, like that's, sort of the beginning era of like thrash and then you, yeah totally like the punk like you're talking about like is sort of venturing into its own thing of what it would become and all the sub genres that would split from that and i mean even yep. metal of glam metal and all of that so i mean it sucks like i didn't grow up in that time frame but that's definitely an era of music that i love just because of how original it is and just kind of unapologetically like you don't like it fuck you like whatever it's so ridiculously over the top yeah it a lot of those genres got that way for sure. And that's kind of what I feel was the, the ending of it, sadly. Mm -hmm. I mean, I love hair metal, even though it's not, shouldn't be called hair metal, but I mean, a lot of those became such a parody of what it was, but I mean, it's like, take away the shitty nature, like CC DeVille, take away like someone like that, the shitty nature of just over the top solos and so forth. But it's like a lot of these people, like you look at the individual musicians and I've always said, like they all were so technically proficient that it just got to a point of like stupidity of like how like over the top like i can tap i can do sweeps i can do all yeah. this crazy shit but it's like we lost the sense of like but look at how technically sound you are at doing this it just i mean it kind of did itself in to me that was definitely part of like when i got so obsessed with like just seeing how fast i could play guitar <laughs> um it took me actually starting my own bands and trying to play with other people to realize that well that's fucking great but we kind of need a song <laughs> like and then i would just and then it got weird because i was listening to like rain and blood by slayer and those solos are fucking garbage 
like, don't get me wrong. I love. I mean, if you like, the, they they are the ACDC of like that genre. I mean, but like, shit. like anybody who's played guitar for a bit, and this is gonna so bomb so many people. But anybody who's played guitar and has a whammy bar can play a Carrie King solo. Like, don't get me wrong, that record, like Rain and Blood, is probably one of my top ten records. Of Amazing all time, record. or just of that genre? Um. Okay, top 20 of all time. <laughs> okay, but, just need to know the scale. Yeah, I had to... Yeah, it was all relative. Um, but there, it wasn't so technically proficient, at least in the solos versus the riffs. The riffs were still really, I, I mean, I thought kind of difficult to play at the time. But I could make my you know 15-year-old self sound just like him with it's like weedily weedily and then hit the whammy bar a few times <laughs> so i was like shit this is for me like it kind of it was the same sort of thing where like you can do this right obviously <laughs> carrie is better now <laughs> i don't know it's debatable um but yeah i'm skipping all around here no that's i mean that's technically... but this is still this is still the same age like yeah Fine, you know, because that record was what eighty five or eighty six. So yeah. I was thirteen when Rain and Blood came out. Okay, and that you know I listened to that record a shit ton, but we were also listening to like, I might be getting the times confused, but we were also listening to like Depeche Mode, Violator. We were I think they came out in like eighty eight or eighty nine. Yeah, so it was yeah. like it was around the same like around. two three year span though. And yeah, coincidentally, as I'm wearing a pseudo funny shirt That's, that I'd. I like to wear just piss people off. It's awesome. I have a Wu Tang one. one, There's a similar one to that, and it just says, I've seen this on Tumblr, but I don't know what it is or something. Well, I was wearing this. I can't remember if I was wearing this shirt or my Wu Tang one where this makes the W. And uh, I walked into a Hot Topic, and they had one that's just cats in this. It's like a fucking (laughs) weird cat shirt. And this girl was like, Do you want this? Isn't this so great? I was like, Just because I wear this doesn't mean like I want everything that is this. Yeah, totally. Uh, so no, I don't. <laughs> but I don't know. I, it's I saw it on uh, at midnight when someone was wearing it. And I was like, "Holy fuck, that's so great!" That's pretty great. And uh, surprisingly, no one catches that. I mean, because the bottom of it says uh, "Boys Don't Cry." Uh, oh, that's even better. <laughs> so it's like when people actually see it. More often times than not, like I just get kind of get like a, another look at it. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, yeah, it's three fucking bands that don't have anything to do with each other technically or the image that you see. But unfortunately, like you said, like everyone just knows that this image is something. Yeah. But they don't know who it is or most people don't know who it is or whatever. I've also wanted to take that Violator album cover and just throw like a Cure logo over it because I'm sure people would think it's a Cure record. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) But uh, no. So, I mean, at that point, like. Obviously, like we kind of said earlier, like, you know, you started, I think from what I remember, Glee's Babies is one of your first bands. It, like, it was. Like, yeah. Well, I mean, I had this other band that I started with some friends in the neighborhood. And we would kind of tr- sort of try to play like Metallica songs. <laughs> and uh, then I was like, you know what? We're not very good at this. We should just write our own songs. And the drummer was like, what do you mean? Like, he had no concept that we could just right. write our own stuff. So that's that's basically what started Glaze Babies then? No, no, no. That, oh, was, okay. yeah, that, that, that started me not playing with him anymore. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. So uh, I was going to a lot. Like I said, I, my, my older sister, who was a couple years older than me, started taking me to all kinds of shows. And I met, uh, you know, a bunch of people around that played music and I kind of just conned them into letting me play with them <laughs> in a weird way, which apparently I developed a skill for. I was just gonna, <laughs> I'm glad you said that. I was going to say it's apparently something you started and continued to do for a long time. Yeah. Um, and then we started Glaze Baby and we had a show booked, but we didn't have a name. And I went to a Dunkin' Donuts and I got this glazed <laughs> bow tie donut thing, but it kind of looked like a baby. So I was like, uh, glazed baby. And it was seriously like we had a show like next week and no name. So I don't remember what the other choices were, but <laughs> we should have thought a little harder. I mean, at the end of the day, band names are 
pretty pointless. I mean, the band is what makes the name, because, I mean, any name really is fucking stupid. Yeah, it just... And the older <laughs> I get, the harder it gets. Now I just have a list of band names for when the next thing breaks up. I still have a list going. <laughs> so... Um, some of them I've already like reserved the Facebook pages for as well. Oh, so. shit. So yeah. it's real. The, the, the wanting of the name is real enough that you've already done that. Um, yes, because I've already made that mistake once. God damn it. It's not going to happen again. <laughs> um, so kind of fast forwarding for, for me for the sake of this and why I actually wanted to talk to you. So one of the first bands that I became aware of that you were in was From Autumn to Ashes. Mm-hmm. And I only vaguely remember hearing about you because from what I remember, you were on the record, uh, grabbing the wolf by the ears, I believe like the pseudo last record. I think they put out one more since at this point, but no, I was on two. Okay. I was on abandon your friends. Okay. And that holding a wolf by the ears one. There was a live one that came out after that. Yeah. 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 Um, but yeah, How the hell so... did that happen? <laughs> Yeah. Well, I was going to say, like, I remember you being in that band and there being kind of a, a weird thing, because at the time, like, and admittedly, like, Shiner was never really anything on my radar growing up. Um, yeah, it would have been probably too early, I would imagine. Or, yeah. You know, um, I mean, it's kind of the great thing about music, though, is you can find it after the fact. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I remember a lot of people, like, there being a, a weird, like, oh, and they have Josh, Josh Newton in the band. And a lot of people being like, oh, that's so weird. It's so weird. And yeah. <laughs> But the internet wasn't really what it is now to where I could just like Google you and be like, why is this so weird? I just, yeah. I remember it being a thing kind of as I'm getting into more like, I guess, metalcore or whatever the fuck you want to call it as, as yeah. when that's coming up and kind of becoming my, my genre that's new. And hearing your name spoken about quite a bit and just kind of being like, eh, I don't understand, you know, this this bass player dude i don't understand why everyone's giving him such a big thing like because at that point the thing to me was that they had lost uh their normal singer the first singer they had and francis kind of took over as the main vocalist especially on the, the grabbing the wolf by the ears record yeah well the thing is is i was the band was still functioning although get you know in decline yeah. when i joined uh ben was still the singer Mm-hmm. Um, cause like I said, I did a record with him still as the, well, not the singer, but the screamer. Whatever. Right. Yeah. Um, the front man. So things were still kind of normal when I first joined, uh, they had replaced the original guitar player, Scott Gross, uh, who it turns out wrote most of those material, most of the material that people were really familiar with and seemed to appreciate. Right. Um, so he, I don't recall if he left or he got kicked out. And then the bass player quit because I think of his girlfriend or something. Typical. Um, and I had met those dudes because I was on tour with Reggie on the full effect. Right. Which so is we another did a, like, weird project you were involved in. Kind of. Um, I mean, I knew, I knew James from Kansas City. And I, I liked Coalesce because that shit was so weird and crazy. Uh, and James used to come into this record store that I worked at all the time. And that's pretty much how we met. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't think I was supposed to really be in From Autumn to Ashes. I was supposed to just fill in. <laughs> and then I just kind of never left. Until I left. <laughs> <laughs> I remember when you officially really got on my radar and I was like, oh, it's it's that guy again. Because you were always just this, this peripheral guy. Because, like, I remember... After the From Autumn to Ashes thing, I think you, in as much as Reggie was an active touring band around that time too, very sporadic, uh, I believe I saw you play a show around here at one, our local college in Grand Rapids. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I forgot. June. I, went, I yeah. went back to Reggie for a bit. Yeah, for like, it felt like a summer or something, at least that tour. Yeah. That tour, well, and I forget who else, it was like with... And I'm probably thinking of completely the wrong band, but it's very much in the same vein of just how fucking weird it was. It was like Rooney and then Reggie in the full effect. And it's like, how does that even fucking go together? Probably. But you... It kind of didn't matter who we played no, with because it no. was always just going to be weird no yes. matter what. Like, <laughs> But I remember hearing some friends of mine, because I wasn't here in Grand Rapids at the time, but I used to come up here all the time for shows. And someone was like, 
like the cool kids that I used to like that were in bands that I looked up to locally and so forth. They were like, "Yo, Reggie and the Full Effects playing at fucking GVSU with like just some other bullshit band, like it's free." And I was like, "All right, I've heard crazy things about that band." Like at the time, they were like a band sort of similar as far as just like the the scope of like just how crazy like the band is. Like in the same breath as I'd hear people talk about like Dillinger, like, "Yo, you ever seen Dillinger? They're fucking crazy." And it's like, you don't know what the music sounds like. You just hear people talk about it and just go, man, dude, that shit, it's so crazy. So it's like, I just had this expectation of like, I don't know what the fuck this is going to be, but like everybody like that I look up to musically is like super into this band and I've heard a lot of good things about them. So I guess I'm going to go check them out. And it definitely was not what I was expecting. <laughs> no. <laughs> Although I don't know what I was expecting because I didn't have any, in, I didn't know. But I just remember being like, hey, it's that guy from From Autumn to Ashes. Like, apparently he's in this band, too. Crazy. Actually, Brian, the guitar player from Autumn to Ashes, he did that tour as well. Okay. Um, but, yeah, Reggie was pure comedy. And just to <laughs> try to be as ridiculous as possible. For We did one tour, and we didn't have an opener. I'm not sure what happened there, but there was no opener. Not, no opening band, no nothing. And James was like, oh, I don't know what we're going to do. I don't know what we're going to do. And I was like, oh, well, I have these two striped shirts with me for some reason. Let's mime to Trapped in the Closet. <laughs> so we did. We were our own opening act. We were mime to Trapped in the Closet. That's almost as funny as when I saw CKY, I think around the same time, actually. And there is this band that I'd never heard of called Fireball Ministry opening up. Oh, yeah, yeah. So this band, or these people come out, they're setting everything up. I'm like, man, this band looks, like, these these roadies look really fucking weird. Like, whatever. And then they get off stage, and the intro, like, like the light, house lights are, like, sort of on. Probably ten minutes goes by. Then, like, an intro comes on. And then those same people come back out. I was like, why the fuck would you, like, set your own shit up, then walk away, and then come back? It's like, why not just start playing? <laughs> and I thought it was... I don't know. It's something that's always stuck with me. It's just something that's weird. You don't see typically an opening band set up all their shit and then just go away and then come back. It's like, yeah, was that really very necessary? Strange. <laughs> but it, it stuck with me and I've always remembered them since. And then I went and saw them when, uh, when they played Max Bar like a year later to nobody, but it stuck with me and I like the music and it's weird to see Jim, uh, get his like held in such high regard and see all those people from the band go on to do like higher profile gigs since then. Yeah. Yeah. But so after that, Reggie, the time in Reggie and seeing you play a random campus show <laughs> and uh, then I then you end up in Every Time I Die, which was like, yep. again, like I was really getting into that band. And then all of a sudden, here's this here's this guy again from from Mom to Ashes. This son up. of a bitch. Yeah. And then it's just like, holy shit. So it's always weird that like every band that like for a solid, I'd say like five, six years, like you just kept popping up and like this thing and i never knew i still never knew like where you're from and everyone's like oh he was in another band oh he was in another band and it always seemed like everyone knew you from the band you were in before so it's like when i see every time i die people are like oh it's the guy from from arm to ashes or you know yeah. my my situation i was like it's the guy from from arm to ashes who was also in reggie and the full effect for at least a tour <laughs> and then you know you have people that are like oh it's the dude from shiner and i'm like Sh shiner and like learning now about you know that but it was the, interesting. Go ahead. I was gonna say the 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 e thing came about because Andy Williams and the old drummer Rat Boy so were shining <laughs> Yeah. According to one of the DVDs that I, I always thought was funny, they were like, "Oh, you broke your bass over a stage," and we were like, the "Guy needs to be in our band." <laughs> <laughs> one that was as simple as it needed to be to be in a band, apparently. Yeah, pretty much. Um, but yeah, that's that's how I. I, I, they were telling me that they were unhappy with the dude that was playing bass with them at the time. or And he was unhappy, apparently. And I was like, fuck it, I'll play bass. Which is the thing that I've said repeatedly that has gotten me in bands. I do find it funny that you started off playing guitar and almost everything that you've done, you play bass. Yeah, it's and it's really not my primary instrument. I... <laughs> I learned how to be a bass player in Every Time I Die. Really? Yeah, because the first record I did with them, uh, Steve Evitz engineered and produced it, and he is a bass player. Okay. 
And I was warned by the bass player from Poison the Well <laughs> that he was going to fucking bust my ass. So I really worked pretty hard uh, on that record. And just trying to be a better bass player, yeah. Now something, and this is kind of where I'll start introducing this this side of things that I wanted to talk about. I don't know if you were big on gear always, like in everything you've done, if you've been a big gear person, because I mean, kind of from the sounds of it of where you started from, of just like, I have a guitar and I have a shitty amp, like I can go. It's interesting to know that that's where it started and to see how big into gear and searching of tones you are and so forth. And something I, I, I kind of had mentioned to, to Andy when, I don't know if it was when I did a podcast with him or just in general and talking to him over the years of going to shows, but he always like change like you know he's always looking for like something that fits him like you know whether it's yeah. a guitar or an amp or you know he's always after you know what sounds good to him whether it be at the time or just the tone he's always been looking for and so what's interesting is i've often wondered with your your love of gear and, and trying to find different tones and so forth if with a lot of the bands that you've been in if that love of gear and stuff like that has helped you you know, be able to step into a band where you haven't maybe written something with them yet to kind of fill in the sound as it sounds on a record and kind of staying more true to that. Cause I mean, we can probably think of a lot of bands where somebody else comes in and people are like his tone's all wrong. doesn't sound like the record or he doesn't play it like this person. And I never really have ever heard that said about anything that you've been a part of. Like, I feel like you've done a pretty good job of matching what the band sound was and then even on the stuff where you write, especially with like Etik, because I mean, there's at least two records that kind of, you know, I think have, the band always is changing. That band is always changing. And I think like those two records, and as much as they are kind of the same, since the band was sort of the same, I think like you can hear a lot more bass stuff going on on those two records than, than I had really on, you know, the stuff they did on uh, Hot Damn or even... Uh, gutter phenomenon i don't know how much yeah. of that is to do with machine or the other dude who produced it and evitz being a bass player and kind of like really making sure that the bass stuff sounded sounded good or you personally or working the band as a whole wanting to to change the sound but i mean that's well, something it, i've kind of always wondered i definitely played like a lot more gnarlier and with more distortion than i think any of etid's prior dudes perhaps um, at least I, I think so. Um, but just to get a gnarlier, more aggressive sound that's more present, just because coming from being a guitar player, <laughs> I mean, I still like, I like playing bass and I like part of what I consider being the defense for like a <laughs> hockey metaphor, you know, the right. drummer being the goalie. Right. Um, I think the Evitz thing, it's crazy because we tracked the bass for, um, New Junk Aesthetic, we tracked the bass last. Really? Yeah. That's weird. So well, what we did was we would find holes where I could do something different and it didn't fuck with anybody. Maybe the vocals were last, but musically we did right. the bass last. So um, weird. It was weird. I, I had no idea that that was... I'd never done it like that before. Even though, you know, I've recorded a bunch and all that stuff, but it was like a pretty novel idea. But in the end, I think it worked out really well because I'm pretty happy with all of the bass parts and sounds on that record. Yeah, it's it's kind of funny because uh, I was in, or I still am, uh, in a Every Time I Die Facebook group and really recently, I would say in the last like four days, there was actually somehow like a, a comment on former members or I don't remember what it was, but somehow you got brought up and a lot of people were talking about, you know, your bass tone and, and a lot of the stuff you were playing and it was interesting because like it's interesting to see other people take notice of things like that with a band that they they are really passionate about and really love and it really made me wonder it's like is it just because of either the production of the record is it is it what you brought to the table because i mean a lot of us start like a lot of people in that conversation started going like well it's because josh is really like a good bass player and he you know does all this kind of stuff and so on and so forth but then you know i, I kind of started to think but you know how much of it is that maybe the songs before didn't require that, or maybe the, the, the bass player couldn't play those kind of things or wasn't that interested or, or whatever. 
So, I mean, it, it kind of, like I said, made me start thinking about more of, since I know you love gear and stuff like that, like, that seems to me when I started noticing your playing within a recorded setting. Because, I mean, like, on the on the From Autumn to Ashes stuff, like, I, I didn't go back and listen to either the record I, I knew you were on, but I don't, nothing really stands out to me either on that no, as far as really. like, you're playing. And so making making that Abandon Your Friends record was not a fun time for me. I didn't really gel with the producer at all. Um, but whatever, that's fine, you know. <laughs> neither here nor there he just I, I just it just bummed me out because he had worked on a lot of records that i liked and then we get there and it was just it was like this crazy just music factory where he had he had like another band still there doing stuff while we were doing stuff and it was just very strange look. to me it was just like a shitty music factory i don't know it was very strange um Interesting. the gear thing definitely has some to do with it just because God damn it, I want to sound like what I think is good. <laughs> uh, and I think with a lot of the older Every Time I Die stuff, there may not have been room to do anything but kind of just support the guitars and maybe not write a separate bass line some of the times. Right. Um, I think what I've heard from the new record, I think Steve did a fucking great job. Is it? Did they do one or two that I'm not on? Whatever. Uh, two, two of them. Yeah, yeah they've they done, done two, two of them. No, three. Because they've done X. No, I'm on X Lives. Okay, never mind. You're right. I, I just realized <laughs> that. I was like, wait a minute. No, I'm wrong. Yeah. No, actually, I'm not on every song. There's a couple songs where Jordan played some stuff. Just because I was kind of hitting the end of my time in that band. <laughs> um, but. See, I just and I actually just saw every time I die last week, and it was pretty pretty rad. Um, Steve's bass sound is awesome. <laughs> it, it is. It's really good. It's gotten, yeah. especially on the newer stuff. It's. I would say Steve on this newer record kind of reminds me of how I felt when you guys did. I think it was Big Dirty, like with your first record with them or whatever, where you really can kind of hear the bass on on that stuff, and. I don't know. It was kind of weird because then the other someone actually, uh, I had mentioned that I was going to do this with you in that Facebook group, and I was like, "Oh, is there anything like you've always wanted to know about the recording, whatever?" And, and no one really had questions that I thought were like super, like, "Oh, that's a really good question." But someone was like, "You know, does he listen to the? Has he listened to the new stuff?" And I kind of thought of that and wanted to take it a step further and actually say, like, you know, if you any of the bands you've been in, but we'll just since we're talking about your time in Eats it at this point. <laughs> Have you listened to anything that they, uh, any band that you've been in has done and then like, fuck, I really, like, I remember maybe this being just this one riff and it was just an idea and it wasn't a fleshed out song, but when you hear it as, as it's done that you're like, man, I really wish I could have played on this or done, you know, gotten to play over this because it's just so cool. Has that ever happened or? Um, I mean, I don't, it's, it's weird. I don't, I tend to not spend a lot of time listening to things that I've either a done at all or B bands that I was in that have, that I've left. Um, I'll just kind of give it a cursory glance just to check it out. Right. But Andy always has a ton of riffs. Always, always. Andy is like a riff savant. He always has shit. And I'm sure this stuff that I heard at soundcheck, that is a song, you know, <laughs> since then. Right. Um, there was something on the last record that I was like, yeah, there was something that I was like, God damn it. Why wasn't that song on the one I was on? I can't remember what it was, though. I just always, I've always wondered that because I, I know like when watching, I think it was the the first Kill Switch, uh, Set This World of Plays DVD they put out, they were talking about when, how long the end of Heartache had been just a, a jam thing. Like, okay, we're all in a room, let's jam something. Hey, let's jam that idea. It doesn't ever yeah. go anywhere. It's just this one thing repeated a million times. And it never went anywhere, and then all of a sudden it's like, oh, now it's this like huge fucking song. It's so crazy, it's like, right? I, yeah. So it's like I know, you know that that happens when you get in a room with people. Like sometimes you'll just jam on something, and then it might have been sitting around for a handful of years, and then finally like light bulb goes off for somebody, and then it it gets fleshed out. So I'd wondered if maybe there was stuff that if you had heard, you were like, fuck, it, I I remember when it was just this like half fleshed out idea, and it didn't go anywhere, and then now here no. it is, and it's this like banger song, and I wish I could have played on it. We always, with 
with ETID, we always kind of wrote like just enough, maybe one more. Right. And if there was an idea and it was like, eh, it just kind of <laughs> went away immediately. It never really, we never, if people not one weren't of those fucking bands stoked. I was going to say, not one of those bands that's like, oh, we got 40 fucking songs for a record. No, 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 no. <laughs> I don't think I've ever been on a band like that that's just had too much shit. I feel like that's a fucking lie. When people say that, I'm like, are they really songs? Or are you just like, well, here's like this riff. That's I mean, I'm just... <laughs> yeah, I think when they say that, like some dude has a, some ideas that are there. But I mean, if it was that fucking good, why is it not on the record? You know, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. Know. No, I, I, I always kind of like <laughs> scoff when I hear people like, oh, we came into we had 40 songs. And I'm like, then why not just put out a fucking double album then? Because, uh, well, <laughs> and literally nobody needs the double album, but no. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I had like the time in my life. I can barely give records that I'm excited about enough attention to take yeah. in the whole thing anymore, which sucks. And I hate, I hate that. I hate that being the case now. Cause it's, I feel like it is like Spotify, like, Oh, you know? Yeah. Okay. Like I waited 20 years or whatever for Chavez to come out with a new EP or new, new anything. Right. And then it did. And I was like, huh? Yeah. <laughs> and it's not that it was bad or any different. I just don't have the time to devote to it that I wish I did to make it be my favorite thing again. Right. And I'm, I'm not, obviously I'm not speaking for everyone. No, but it's hard too, because when I'm on the road, I don't really listen to music at all because you're just around that kind of environment, like all the time. So you just want silence. <laughs> I will. If in my hotel, I pretty much never turn on the TV ever. Um, and if I have something on, it's probably Howard Stern. It's funny. It's kind of <laughs> happening. Cause like I was telling someone, Actually, yesterday we were driving and I heard the new Queens of the Stone Age single on the radio. And I was like, oh, yeah, I, for I fucking forgot this just came out. And then, like, I literally, like, pulled it up on iTunes Music and fucking started listening to it. But I would say typically, like, I have eight hours to, like, at my job, like, making T-shirts, basically. Like, so I just I typically just listen to podcasts. And Me it's too. really yeah. weird. It's really weird that I would rather listen to people talk than to listen to new music. And I would just kind of feel like I'm falling behind on a lot of shit. But the weird thing is, though, is I feel like. I hear some of these artists get to talk about things and then it makes me feel like I've gone through the process of making that record when they talk about it. So then I like, totally get that. So then yeah. you're like, well, I don't really need to listen to the record. <laughs> really, I was already there. Really weird. Yeah, I was already there. I was in the <laughs> studio. I heard all the stories. Um, so it's really, I, I've kind of been noticing that a lot more recently, but um, I'm kind of actually getting to your, your constant touring now. So around the time of you leaving Eats Aid, you were involved in the damn things. Uh, yes. Not, from what I understand, not so much in the actual recording of, but to be more the live bass player. Yes, I had played every damn thing show. Yeah. Uh, never, never. I didn't do any of the recording. Rob Caggiano, who's in Volbeat now, he was he played the bass. The time. Yeah. yeah. How was it, <laughs> again, how was it kind of coming in and does it feel like, because I've always wondered with you being asked to do a lot of things, and, and I'll ask you if you want to share the story that you gave, told me the other day, just because I think it's interesting, but kind of speaks to this. Everyone knows you for, for playing bass, and you get asked to do a lot of bass stuff, and you know, you're in a, a I hate using this fucking term, but you're in a super group, uh, and for those who are listening and won't see this, I just use air quotes. Um, yeah. <laughs> but you were involved in this this group where everything's been done, and, you know, between the pedigree of that band, between, you know, Rob being an Anthrax and, and having access to, like, the bands that they tour with and Joe and Fall Out Boy and any of the people that they could have gotten, and then Keith, obviously, you know, how is it to, how does it feel, like, to be picked to, to play, you know, these songs and to be the bass player that's playing this stuff? Like, I mean, it's got to be kind of nice to know that, like, oh, man, that, you know, apparently I do such a good job that people want me consistently. I think initially, uh, it was just like the guy they had, they didn't think he was good enough. <laughs> um, and that wasn't even to the point where they were playing shows yet. That was just like, he, was, he wasn't good enough to actually like record the record, okay. which is why Rob, Rob did everything. I hear um, Rob just kind of does that as it, as it is, though, it sounds like. He likes to play oh, yeah. a lot of the shit by himself, like himself. Yes, because he can play <laughs> fucking everything. That's what I've heard. Dude can play every instrument. 
He's awful. I hate him. <laughs> he's a good drummer. He's fucking, he can just sit down and play the piano and make you cry. He's, he's really, he is an, a savant and it's insane. He like forgets to look both ways before he crosses the street, but he can play every fucking <laughs> instrument there is. I, I know people um, like that too. And you're just like, motherfuckers. Yeah. Um, but so I think initially it was like, oh, well, I, I think I asked Keith. I was like, so who's doing this thing? And he's like, I don't know. You want to do it? And I was like, sure. And then it was easy because it came, but it it it, fit, it figured into like, it's two guys from this band. It's two guys from this band. It's two guys right. from this band. And yeah. it was like a thing, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. And it was it was fun. I had a good time. Man, it's crazy. I'm looking over at the set list you gave me from the Machine Shop show. From I didn't realize it's been fucking six years already. Jesus Christ. Holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> and actually part of that, you know, getting to be so close with Troman and him becoming, you know, one of my best friends. Yeah. It was very cool. You know, like this, cause I was not the biggest fallout boy fan in the world to begin with. Uh, I, you know, I didn't, it's just, it was out of my wheelhouse musically and not something I would really listen to. Yeah. And they're all like the sweetest fucking dudes. Yes. And, I don't know. It's just it's cool to go to go do something that is outside of your wheelhouse and then end up being so comfortable and, and making really great friends. It's pretty awesome. Well, it's funny about the one of the tours you did with Volbeat is and this is before Caggiano ended up joining Volbeat. It's it's very weird to have gone to see that tour and see how all the some of the parts yeah. moved. But I remember you at one point filled in for Volbeat on I, that tour, finished out that tour. I, I ended up playing bass for Volbeat, too. Yes. And I was like, holy shit, is he going to like segue? Because at that point, I think you were done with ETID officially. So I was uh, like, holy shit, is he sliding into I wasn't, this Volbeat? I wasn't totally done, um, but I did have to leave the Volbeat tour to go play one show in Europe with Every Time I Die. And the airline lost my fucking basses. I literally flew there for one show. They lost my bases. I ran around trying to borrow one from somebody. And I think like Dropkick Murphys or somebody was there with a lefty bassist and they were going to let me use their bass. And then they showed up like literally like minutes before we played. Crazy. Um, then I flew back and finished the tour with Volbeat, even though damn things were off the tour. Right. And then the weird thing is, is I think you ended up over because when Volbeat, I think was on a five finger death punch tour right after that. Uh, yeah and you were on that and i know you i was guitar teching yeah okay and see that was the thing is i I knew you were here in grand rapids and i was like are you still on that tour and so like i was telling a friend of mine who was doing photography for that i was like yo get like snap some shots of josh because i'm sure no one's gonna fucking take photos of him (laughs) because you're not in the band and like people (laughs) probably wouldn't know who you were and so he was like oh i don't see this guy and i was like huh so it seems like that was kind of the start of your teching career um, no, I mean, I had already done a bunch of Fall Out Boy stuff. Okay. I guess that wasn't as publicized, whether it be yeah, it, you or well, Joe it was just on, like, on socials. Those dudes just started, like, you know, they started up, we knew they were doing stuff, and right. the record was already done, but nobody knew, and they you know, announced it in Chicago and started playing some shows. Yeah. So I teched for all that stuff. That was my first real, I'm only a tech experience. Now... I think what's funny is a lot of people assume if you are a touring musician, you probably know how to tech. And I think <laughs> it's pretty interesting from people I know in the industry who that's pretty much what they do, how much more it is involved than people actually think. Like a lot of people like on a smaller level, like a lot of local bands will ask me like, yo, like we're going to go hit the road. Like, do you want to be like our tour manager tech? Cause like you book shows, all that kind of shit. Like you can kind of understand that aspect of things and settling out. And you play guitar, so you could probably tech. And I go, I don't know fuck all about guitars. Like, if your pickups are are (laughs) fucked, I don't know how to fix those. Like, that's beyond my realm of knowledge. Like, I can tune your guitar. I can restrain it and tune it. But if something internally messes up, like, you're fucked and I can't help you. (laughs) That's what most dudes that hit me up via Facebook or whatever. Like, oh, you know, you transitioned out of, you know, being a full-time musician to do this. I could do it right. And I'm like, well, yeah, but this is where the, my obsession with gear comes yes. in. Yep. You know, and I can do all that weird crap. I mean, I had to learn 
I've, obviously I've gotten better as I've gone along, like with setting up guitars and, and whatever, but I text for myself for 20 years before this, right. like literally 20 years right. before I, other people started paying me to do it. <laughs> so I kind of put the time in. Right. <laughs> I feel like an asshole saying it, but no, I mean, it's, if I, something it's, goes wrong, I can probably figure out what it is fairly quickly. Well, I think I had remembered you being interviewed or something through like guitar world or guitar something. And they were talking about Joe's setup and you were explaining how like one show, like something in the rig, like in his pedal board or whatever, fucked up. Mm. But you had to find the signal because I guess it was all like through wireless, like the wireless packer, wireless stuff. And yeah, you're yeah. Like, so we're overseas and like using gear that I'm not particularly familiar with because I think that was why you were also explaining that like in the States and shit, like you have two or three rigs that are yeah. traveling constantly. And this wasn't like your typical rig, I guess, from the sounds of it. And you were going talking about how like. So, like, the show's happening, something happens to the rig, and I have to start figuring out where the problem is in the daisy chain of everything and then yep. try to work my way around it while he's still trying to play and get it all figured. And, like, I just remember being like, now, this isn't, like, some sweaty VFW hall you're fucking doing this at. Like, it's, like, big arenas and shit, and you're just like, I would be like, I would freak the fuck out. <laughs> I mean, there there were a couple shows where it was just like, fuck it, here's a long cable. I'm plugging you into the amp. <laughs> See you on the other side, you know, like th that happened a couple times, but more often than not, it, I've had pretty good luck. I mean, amps have died, whatever, you know, shit right. happens. Yeah. Um, but I've never had something. And I mean, I guess there is nothing as catastrophic as it's going to like end the show. I say this now, but. I can tell you about a time I saw Motley Crue play the first show of that farewell tour and Tommy Lee's kit broke twice. <laughs> and it took like 30 minutes for them to fix the kick drum. And I was like, I've seen local bands fix a drum faster than this. I can't imagine how fucking that, that drum tech must have wanted to blow his brains out. Yeah. And then when they fucked it up like 20 minutes later, <laughs> wow. they just stuck out Mick Mars out to play his like bullshit little wing solo that he that's about all he knows how to play around. I mean, from what I understand, that whole tour was a nightmare, though, because they had that big yeah, the roller coaster drum set thing. Yep. But then they booked a lot of, like, shed shows, which you can't have that thing there. Yeah. I don't know. It's very strange to me. Yeah. But... It seems like a lot of uh, bungles of situations. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, so, I kind of wanted to speak a little bit about with Knives. Um, having booked you guys once and seen you twice in a span of like a week or so which was awesome uh what was interesting is i i and kind of speaking a little bit to even your newer project which i i'm not even going to try to pronounce because I, i'm not <laughs> fluent in whatever the fuck that is I think it's, it's german it's german okay uh it's pronounced the lieben machinen okay i just know it, it's i love machines or something like that or yeah love i love you love i'm not sure what the exact yeah, yeah. um but with that being said, like I had remembered that with Nimes it was actually just a project that was all you, I thought initially. And yep. then I don't really remember if, if it's ever been discussed how Joe got involved, other than maybe just you showing him the demos and he was excited about it. Yeah, it was literally like us getting drunk in the back lounge on the bus on tour somewhere. Oh, okay. And him being like, you know, everyone just playing shit and maybe it came up randomly on my phone or whatever, you know. However, it started, and that kind of was, you know, the impetus for the whole thing. And then what's funny is none of those songs ever actually got used for With Knives. Right, because I think you because, put out a demo of, of that stuff, I think, at one point. Or yeah, just random stuff. But then, like, he, we started writing together, and that kind of became what it was. And I still think it's funny that you ended up playing bass on that project. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I don't even think I played guitar in the record. I think I just played bass and percussion. I think that's what you were credited for. But I, it's like, I didn't really want to because I wanted him to have this different thing than he had been known for or done before, too. I think, and I talked about this on a, on a different podcast, actually. It's really weird. I'm one of those people who will follow somebody if, I, if I'm if i a fan of what they do, whether it be tone, playing, personality, mm -hmm. whatever. I, I'll follow people. And 
it's been, it was interesting to have gone to the show that I helped book with some friends when you guys played Holland at that coffee shop. Yep. And it was weird to see the hype, at least on the Facebook group, when people realized who was in the band. Yeah. And people being like, oh my God, oh my God, this is going to be awesome. And then the fucked up thing was like the next, I was expecting it to be packed and there was a shitload of kids. But then when you played, everyone was too cool to, to, to watch you. And I was like, what the fuck is this? Yeah. And it's it's not something that I'm completely like shocked of because I've seen it enough by going like I remember going to see Stu Ross and, and Brandon from Misery Signals play one of the first tours they did with a uh, low talker and they played at a bar and there was probably five of us there. Mm-hmm. And it's like, dude, there's people from Comeback Kid and Misery Signals like what's not and it's great like 90s kind of like alternative shit like what's not to like about this. And it's just interesting to see firsthand how people, if you're not this, that whatever this thing is that you are known for, people don't, yeah. don't follow it. And it's just, it's kind of shocking, especially after the sort of success of the damn things and how people kind of, I figured, weren't expecting it to be what it was. So I, I honestly expected people to be more interested in, with Knives. I don't know if it's just because it's kind of, <laughs> there's no denying it, it's kind of weird. Um, Yo, yeah, totally. but I mean, I fucking love what it is and, and it's weirdness and I think it works, but I don't know if people were like, Oh, Joe's saying I wasn't expecting that or, or it's not fallout boy. So I don't like it or it's not heavy. In... Well, at the time fallout boy still weren't doing anything. So no. fallout boy, like they're, whatever the dudes in fallout boy did otherwise, they were being punished <laughs> by the fans for not being fallout boy still. Do you think that's, I mean, you can speak to it more than I can, but do you really think that that's what it is? Just the fans are punishing them because it's not what we want. Yes. I think that's, I think that's gone away since they've become an active band again. So do you think think if you were to dust off with knives and do something else and tour around it, do you think you would see more people coming out to, to give it a chance or no? Maybe not with knives, but definitely damn things. Okay. See, I thought the damn thing stuff you guys did was actually always pretty well attended. I don't know how much of that is due to the fact that you guys picked good tours to support tours. There was that, and I, I mean, it doesn't hurt to have, you know, Anthrax dudes in it. And I mean, With Knives was intentionally as under the radar as it could have been. You know? <laughs> it it still well, was I interesting just... to, to see that and then see you guys go out with Wilson for a hot, like, couple weeks, I think. It was just like, we just... You know, the major label stuff, again, was weird with... Oh, with, uh, yeah, I didn't even think about that. Damn things. And so it was like, we didn't want anybody else involved in it. That's why it's totally, it was totally self-released. And we were just like, fuck it. Let's just get in a van. Stay where we stay. Whatever happens, happens. You know, it's like a hearkening back to younger <laughs> years, maybe. Um, So at that point, with you doing Fall Out Boy teching... And then it's been interesting because obviously that's been like your, your main thing. And what was interesting to me is actually seeing you play in Fallout Boy for a hot couple of shows. Actually, I remember you doing the, was it the Bruno Mars cover for the BBC? Because Joe uh, had to go home. Yeah. <laughs> and I didn't, I didn't know we were playing that song until the night before. <laughs> you looked very concentrated while you were playing that. Oh, boy. That, that, was, some, <laughs> that was some stiff funk. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was interesting and i was like oh that's it's, it's it's interesting to see you play that song in that style and you looked very uncomfortable looked very sweaty and uncomfortable like, like yeah i like mean I, was, I just I, did, I didn't want to fuck it up you know? right like i was i didn't want to let joe down i didn't want to like let their fans down and just put in you know to do like a half-assed performance or whatever. And I'm also, even though there's an element of fuck it to everything I do, I'm a super perfectionist. Right. Well, that so. kind of actually leads really well into the, because I think you actually played legit shows at that same time over mm-hmm. on, that, on that European tour. And I'm going to ask this, and I, don't, and, and I realize it kind of sounds like a, a backhanded statement, but I mean, you've never really been in anything that's, that's gotten to play like to, to that level. Yeah. So what is it like to play? I mean, you like, we've already kind of discussed you, you, you've kind of come into other bands throughout like their, their careers. 
and helped them out and been in an, an active part of that band for a little bit. But what's it like to kind of step in so kind of last? I mean, I'm sure you knew it was coming before. Obviously, the, the rest of us is the, you know, the fans know that like, hey, Joe's leaving or has to leave for a little bit. Like there's probably a yeah, bit of yeah. preparation on, on your guys' end to know that you can, you know, rehearse and, and so on and so forth. We didn't really rehearse, actually. I, I mean, I did on my own. <laughs> okay. But the band, we, I think we did, like, sound checks a couple times, okay. maybe. Yeah, but I was going to say, I'm <laughs> sure... And then somehow, like... still, there was a set list with a song I'd never fucking played on it before. <laughs> 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 well, I mean, it also would probably lend itself to that you would know the set just because of you actively being, you know, the, the tech for Joe and, and, so totally. and so forth and knowing the changes and so, you know, everything. That's one thing that was funny. It was, like, the first time Joe couldn't do something uh they got um ryland from cobra starship to fill in okay and it was super to me i'm be, this is gonna come across like a dickhead but it was just he didn't really fit to me okay. like a he's a foot and a half taller than all those dudes so it looked <laughs> weird on stage uh and he just there just wasn't the same dynamic and he didn't know the show Okay. So then, like, next time came up, and I was like, you know, Joe was like, would you, do you think you'd do this? Would you be willing to try to, to do this for me? And I was like, yeah, I'm kind of bummed you didn't ask the first time, quite honestly. <laughs> um, but who texts for funny. you at that point? Uh, me. Every show that I played with Fall Out Boy, I still text for myself. <laughs> they were I like, didn't know if the bass tech would like, come no, over. Or God damn it. I can do this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Oh, so, man, that's that, really flying without a net on that one. Yeah. Um, nothing ever went wrong, so that was good. But uh, it was just – it was easy for me with those dudes because I knew the show. I kind of just – it was it's sort of weird because aside from me, like, paying a lot more attention to what I was doing just to get it right because I'm not super familiar with actually playing the stuff. But I knew the weird, like, moments when the dudes would usually interact during songs – Right. Which is, I know it's very strange to say, but nope. I've seen a lot of bands do it, like, on certain points in certain songs, like, dude will go over to this other guy and, like, acknowledge him. And I see, you know, I see Kings of Leon do it. I've seen Fall Out Boy do it. It's just, like, there's certain moments where the band members will interact. And since I know the show, I kind of, like, it was just, like, almost like playing Joe in a play. It was very strange, but fun. The other part of you filling in for Joe that, and now knowing what we talked about earlier, as far as you like wanting to be more of a shredder and play a million things, Joe is the lead guitarist. Yeah. So, I mean, I know there's not a ton of leads in Fall Out Boy stuff, but how was it like to actually be sort of like a self-fulfilling prophecy? Like all these years later, like now you're in a pop punk band and you're getting to play some leads. (laughs) The funny thing is, is that the set, the set they had picked, there wasn't a lot of lead stuff. Oh, okay. And if anything, I think I played the songs more like the records than Joe did just because he's played those songs a trillion times. Right. And would kind of just, you know, songs evolve as bands play them. Yeah. I think if anything, I played them all more, kind of more like the record, I think, than than Joe probably would normally. It's got to be kind of a bummer to like to finish like playing a show and then you're like and now i have to tear down this whole ring <laughs> i was i was fucking sweaty i can tell you that it's probably just gotta be like i i, sh- I should start tearing down because that's my my actual job but i just got done playing a show and i want to like chill for a little bit i would take a couple minutes and it's funny because one of the sh- some of the shows we did were in the uk and the fans saw me loading out and they were like what the fuck are you doing <laughs> and i was like this is actually my job that show thing was no big deal. You know, that was just extra. This is my job. Have uh, have people obviously recognized, like when you first started doing the teching for a Fall Out Boy, would people recognize you and just assume you were there to hang out? And then be like, oh, what are you doing here? Um, No, not really. No? Uh, there wasn't a lot of crossover. Here and there, but very minimal. I think It actually my- happens more now with Kings of Leon than anything. I think one of my favorite things that you posted around that time was just like people sending you, I think on Twitter, sending you photos of you like at like different like shows that the band was on and you're like yeah. side stage, like arms crossed looking. They're like, it's great to see you just looking bummed, like on side stage Always on national TV. Always looking super <laughs> fucking pissed. Yeah. But that's because I'm like working and paying attention. I'm not, in, I'm not there enjoying it. I'm like 
waiting for something to fucking go wrong. Or like I'm waiting for, for the plane yeah. to crash. You yeah. know, <laughs> it's it's just always funny that people do that to you, and it's like you have this reputation of being like this grumpy old man, and it's like anytime I've ever like hung out with you at shows or whatever, you're always like like this, like very like jokey and like pretty loose. So it's always I'm funny pretty, that like yeah, I'm pretty fucking goofy. I just have a pissed off looking face. I think it also doesn't help that uh sometimes like dry humor doesn't come across to some people no some people think that that's just you being an asshole <laughs> yeah <laughs> i mean that's like today like the other day at work i was like catching for someone and like it was a newer person and i just was like i stacked up like i'm really good at stacking the shirts and all that kind of shit so i was like they came over and they're like is everything good i was like yeah this is like where we mark all the bad ones right like where you're supposed to write everything good and they're like are you, are you serious I was like, no, dude, like everything's fine. We're done. We're done with this job. And they're like, oh, <laughs> you totally had me. And like they were like, <laughs> like about to get really mad at me. And I was like, no, like, no. Like that's the best when you I can sell it. Yeah, that well, that's perfect. Uh, I wouldn't say it happens all the time, but I think like people don't like. I think people think I'm just the asshole at work because like I typically just have my headphones on and listen to people talk, and I don't really interact with anyone unless something's like going wrong. And then it's like, yeah, because I don't have to talk to you unless something's going wrong. But, um, actually I wanted to know how you got going on with the Kings of Leon. Cause like when I realized you were still touring and then I was like, Fallout Boy's not doing anything. And that you were yeah. with Kings of Leon. I was like, that's, I understand from having, like, again, a lot of friends in the industry that do kind of your side of things, more of the behind the scenes stuff. I see the network now of people like, Hey, I need a front of house person, blah, blah, blah. Like I, I see these posts on a lot of like Facebook stuff and, and so on and so forth. So I see how easy it is to kind of get involved with other bands and, and so forth based on your your work history. So in that regard, I, I totally understand how you could get a job with the Kings of Leon. But yeah. it still is like one of those where I was like, man, like you went from Fallout Boy to another really pretty big band. You know, like it was I was kind of interested to find out how you, you got involved with those guys and what that's been like. That literally came from uh, the tour that Fallout Boy did with Paramore. Okay. Their their drum tech, Nate. Uh, I guess he, you know, finished up with Paramore and got hired by Kings of Leon a couple years ago. Um, actually, it's funny because it's all just, it, it's touring from like, so much of it's from Warp Tour, believe it or not, actually. No, I, I know you don't know this because you don't follow any of my stuff, but uh, so... <laughs> I mean, I'm just calling it like it is. I mean, no one, I know typically like, you know, we're friends on a lot of social media, but it's like, I'm sure you like don't see my shit that I post. So it's whatever. But having just gone through this past year's warp tour, because a friend's on it, uh, TMing for CKY, coincidentally, we got hooked up with one of those like no access needed things. So to me, the more interesting thing when my wife and I went was to, I just paid attention to like the set, like the the tms and and like basically all the sound people like the yeah everyone that's working both for the bands and for the the tour mm -hmm. and it was just fucking crazy to see how so well ran that thing is just day in and day out all the stages watching well there's a, together. there's a lot a lot a lot going on on that tour. so many moving parts yeah and it's, like it's that was insane. so for like the eight or ten hours we were there like i just kept watching everyone working and just being like wow this is holy shit this is incredible and i know like no one else probably gave a fuck about anything that was going on like that to me so what's i forget what year it was but it was the same year the bronx and us were on I think so it may have been four or oh seven i think it was eight i did every i did like six eight and ten i think okay anyway but reliant k was on the same stage as the bronx okay so I, I would see the Reliant K dudes around a lot, specifically the drummer. And he's like a bigger dude, tall guy. And I was always like, God, that guy looks so fucking mean. <laughs> and uh, so I was teching with Band of Horses. So I, we did this festival show with Kings of Leon. Run into Nate, who used to tech for Paramore, who's now teching for Kings of Leon. And this other guy, Ethan the mean guy from Reliant K <laughs> who is probably one of the fucking sweetest dudes I've ever met in my life. We just didn't know each other. We just never really just met. He just like is a bigger dude. Well, I just was like, that guy looks, well, what's his? And he probably thought the exact same thing about me. Like, why is that? Here's what's that dude? Problem? He's angry. 
Not huge, but yes. An angry little guy. Okay. Um, but I work with both of those guys in Kings of Leon now. That's strangely enough. It's so weird, like, because yeah, I was actually thinking, uh, I mean, if you were doing the tour with Paramore, obviously I think Aaron would have been drumming for them still. Yes. So, I mean, at that point, I don't, I don't think you would have done any touring with Underworld and he did, but I feel like... We did. You did you? Okay. I was going to say, like, there's even another connection to something you had done previous to yep. the teching gig. Like, oh, there's, like, you know, someone that I used to play shows with, you know, a handful of years ago. Yeah. So, it's kind of funny. I I have learned in the handful of years of doing it, my own booking of like national touring bands and so forth and, and just kind of having friends, befriending bands. It's so weird how incestuous the whole music industry is as a whole. Between, yeah. Like the damn things is a great example of just like things totally. kind of falling together and then how you got involved with it. And then even now, like in this part of your, your career of, you know, teching, like it all stems from something that happened, you know, what? almost eight years ago nine years yeah. ago. so i mean it's like the connections you make you never know how far down the road like it's you know gonna pan back out to you i mean i started people. playing with every time i die 10 years ago right now yeah that's crazy <laughs> yeah it's that's totally crazy it was really weird uh someone was asking me because i one of the first shows i got to do to to do show reviews was the, like an every time I die show and I was like oh it's really crazy like something I've always wanted to do which is write about music and I get to do it about one of my favorite bands and what was kind of interesting about it was like someone was like the photographer that was doing the show was like so what uh how many times have you, how many times will this have been for you like is this like you're like what seventh time eighth time and I was like uh I think this is like my 20th third or 24th <laughs> and he was like really and i go yeah and he goes and like my wife always jokes she's like why do you need to see a band that many times and i was like i don't know why not i was like because you know what one day they're gonna go away and i'm gonna be like man i wish i would have gone i was yep. like i have too many of those memories and i was like i mean same with refuse like i've seen them twice now since they've come back but i mean that was a band i never thought i would get to see yeah totally has there been an instance of since they, you know you get to do some of these crazier cross set like crossover tours and so forth between Kings of Leon or even Fall Out Boy where you've gotten to see a band you never thought you'd get to see? Just because I mean I think something that people don't realize is when you're on tour, not only do you get to not see your family, but typically you don't get to see any shows either. Either whether I you just don't want to or whatever. I uh, we did a festival when I was with Band of Horses. We did a festival somewhere Denmark maybe. And I got to stand on, like, just us Band of Horses dudes got to stand on the side of the stage and watch PJ Harvey. Oh, wow. It was just us. It was fucking crazy. <laughs> and it was very, very, very cool. Um, yeah, between, I don't know, it's... PJ Harvey's up there. Uh, I'd like to be able to sneak onto the see Radiohead once that'd be nice but <laughs> yeah like... we actually I did I saw I saw Radiohead at um uh the fucking Austin City Limits festival oh. but I didn't get on stage <laughs> kind of in, in closing something with Shiner now being a, a pseudo active band again I was reminded recently of, I don't remember how long ago this was, but I remember finding one of the, the earlier Shiner records at a CD store, like the CD of it. And I punishingly like sent you a thing. It was like, Hey, look what I found. Cause I don't know. Like I don't really find Shiner CDs out in the wild very often. So yeah. I was just like, Oh, hey, here's the thing. And I think at the time it was like when I was getting into the band. So I think that's the other significance for me. Why I was like, Oh, this would be something I should send you on social media. But something I've been kind of thinking about a lot more is, and I don't know if, because like we had said earlier, I wasn't, a, Shiner was too early for me as far mm -hmm. as like the age I am and, and the music I was getting into at the time. So I can't really speak to how big the band was in its, when it was still going the first time around. But what's interesting to me is I feel like sometimes bands that aren't around anymore and maybe Refused is kind of a good example but 
the when people aren't aware like never got to see it or it hasn't been around for a long time we kind of glamorize it in a way where it's like it the the legend grows bigger than what was actually the reality of things absolutely is is that a, is that a good kind of indicator of how shiner is now like where it's like people appreciate it more now because it wasn't around for so long and so therefore yeah. people want to go see the see you guys play now and is it better now thing, than kind of it was back then or, or am it's I much kind better of, okay the best thing we ever did was not play for 10 years <laughs> okay like it, not only like people coming out but like even personally like within the band Taking that time away, dudes growing up more, certainly for myself, um, or dudes like having kids and having priorities change. It's things with Shiner could not be any better from people coming out to the shows, giving a shit that we're redoing the records, and us just having fun playing with each other. It's been fucking awesome, and I absolutely appreciate it. It's very it's it's humbling to see how much people give a shit about you know sometimes <laughs> do you feel that the resurgence of vinyl over the last six seven years has kind of helped your guys's the the re rekindling of the the love of your band and your music yeah because i mean at the time for some of those records they just weren't making vinyl right like Starless never came out on vinyl. The Egg never came out on vinyl. Lula never came out on vinyl. Actually, All, you know, three of the ones that we've, the three that we've reissued, such a weird time, because I don't even know if there were cassettes of those records. It's just it was just like CD and that's it. Tough shit. Here it is. Yeah, they're tough to get. You know, they suck to carry around and they're gonna break. <laughs> it's I don't I don't miss CDs at all. <laughs> No, I, I don't, and I think what's interesting is, like, because I, I collect vinyl, and what's been interesting is, like, a lot of people are like, oh, I can't believe you have the, like, I basically just collect the shit that I had on CD, and I I, I just want to have on something that's a little bit more... Yeah, immersive. I mean, I, I do that, too. I totally do that. Um, I mean, like, coincidentally, like, a lot of people give me shit for having the first, like, handful of corn records on vinyl, and I even spent a stupid amount of money on the, one of the test presses of the first record, but out of that's five awesome. copies. But it's, <laughs> I like the completionist. Yeah, I mean, there's newer stuff, and I, I stopped after basically. I still have to get un Untouchables. It's kind of the last one I sort of like, but I mean, it's one of those things like people kind of shit on it, and then it's like, but I fucking have it, and they're like, oh, you have this? Oh man, I used to love issues when it. Or, I mean, <laughs> Life is Peachy when it first came out. Holy shit! Blah, yeah. blah blah blah. So it's always funny like that people shit on some of these things, and and then like, but when you have like a tactile like thing you're holding on to and you put it on the record player and you kind of got to be more involved with it like as far as getting up and listening to it it's interesting to see how even records people don't like people are just like oh i remember this and blah blah blah. so it kind of made me think about your guys's music and i mean you guys have been seemingly putting out re not represses i guess first presses over the last like three or four years it seems with the I think yeah i think the it's egg. been five now yeah i was gonna say the egg was the first one you guys put out right yeah we've gone we've gone backwards chronologically with okay. the records how they were released yeah um and then uh, did i see that you guys are doing a repress of one of them we yeah there's gonna be a spanish label hit us up uh they want to they they did they're doing the egg it's the same uh it's the same it's just different it's just a totally different colorway so a different variant yeah, and there's only like 500 of them, I guess. So. Um, lastly, you're doing. You said you want to do a 12 inch for. I'm doing it, goddammit. it! You, you and I have been talking about this for a while. I think since yeah. it came out. Actually, we also had talked about. Uh, yeah, because you wanted, to, and I don't know if I'm gonna spoil anything. So if if I am, I can edit this out. But you wanted to do a glow in the dark. You had said. Yes. Is that still the goal? Uh, it was. I don't know if it is anymore. I think it's just probably going to be like a splatter thing now. I don't, I don't know. I kind of lost. I bought a glow-in-the-dark record, and the you can hear, I swear you can hear the granules in it, <laughs> and it doesn't sound awesome. Okay. I can totally believe it. Like, people have been going ape shit over that, I think it was Friday the 13th, with the blood. And all I can yeah. think of is it's like, but it moves. So if a record's yeah, moving, totally. like, isn't that going to shift the weight and then the needle and all that? And I was like, yeah. I guess from like 
I guess no one's probably buying that to actually listen to it, but all they can think of is like practically, that's a stupid idea. <laughs> I bought a Sonic Youth Bull in the Heather 12 inch or 10 inch or something, and it had glitter in mm-hmm. the vinyl. That sounds guess like what? a terrible idea. You can fucking totally hear it. <laughs> yeah, I bet. <laughs> yeah. There's random clicks everywhere. So hopefully, because you made the comment you're not moving on to the next one, the next album, yes. until you finish, until this comes out on vinyl. I'm seriously going to do like a fucking run of 100, but God damn it, I'm going to do it. Well, I, I need one of those. And then secondly, I need one of the test presses. <laughs> That's my other thing. I've been collecting test presses too, which is a, another sad thing to do. I still have all the test pressings from the Shiner records, even though I don't have the records. <laughs> I was going to buy them off Discogs. I'm that pathetic. That would be so <laughs> funny to have someone be like, I sold one to some guy named Josh Newton. I mean, there's a guy in the band named that, but why would he buy his own record from me? I mean, I've bought Glaze Baby stuff off eBay. <laughs> I've, never, I've never kept anything. Of weird. anything, that's not true. I have some of the first seven inches and in the first test pressings of that band, but I just forget. Like, if if someone who actually gives a shit wants it, I'd want. I'd rather have them have it. So you can then but, buy it back from them, like. But then I want it. Later <laughs> on, yeah. Then I want it twenty years after the fact. Uh huh. And it's not like I'm going to listen to it. I don't know. I mean, there there are a handful of records I have that. I mean, there was a record I sold for. God, I've had it for a while. I think I've listened to it like once or twice. Yeah. And I had the now former singer sign it. And people were just blowing me up for it. And I was like, nah, no, I'm not selling, I'm not selling. And then someone goes, I'll give you like 200 bucks for this thing. And I was like, well, because no one came at me with a number. Yeah. So when he said 200 bucks, I was like, oh, okay, when's the last time I honestly listened to this thing? <laughs> there's, I was like, I can use this, $200. There's this six finger satellite record. And I'm always checking eBay for their records, even though I think I have most of them. I, uh, I went to go clean out my apartment in Kansas City, and I looked at my records, and I realized that I have this record that I was just about to buy for 150 bucks. I already have it, and I forgot that I have it. So, yeah. <laughs> so I would have gladly bought it again and been like, God damn it, when I found it. Uh, in closing... I always, uh, and these, I mean, I, we could talk records for a while and maybe we can do that again around record store day or something. There's a weird fucking whatever, uh, if you're not busy, but, um, I always end the song and episodes with a song. So what, uh, what would you like me to play the episode out to and maybe give a backstory as to why it doesn't have to be anything you've been involved in. could just be something that you're vibing with right now that you've been listening to. Ooh. Yeah. Let me. Look at my computer for a second so I can get the title right. Okay. <laughs> you probably, I mean, you can find this. Oh, I'm totally, here's the funny thing. So I usually rip songs off of YouTube. Yeah. And I always get, like, when I throw these up on, like, I'll end up throwing this episode up just probably, like, literally you and I, like, the video of you and I talking. Because, oddly enough, when I do that, it gets more hits. And then. So, I found it. Okay. There's this band. They were from Indianapolis. Haste of the Day. Called we are hex oh i've heard of them they put out a single on jack white's label and that song is whatever but they have this song <laughs> called yeah i mean the great for them i guess it wasn't maybe it wasn't great i don't know but they have this song called birthplace of the mystics and uh i think it's a fucking rad song and i'm bummed that they broke up that's all <laughs> okay and uh so it's a song that I've listened to, like there's six thousand plays of it on Spotify. You're probably responsible for like eight hundred. Two hundred of them are probably me. Yeah. <laughs> Why don't you just buy it? I have it. Oh okay. <laughs> That's the other thing. I listen to Spotify all the time, and I listen to shit that I own, <laughs> digitally and on vinyl. Yeah, I, I, I tend Whatever. to do that too. <laughs> well, it saves the vinyl, so you're not like ruining it. Yeah. Although I, I had this conversation with my dad, they, they they figured out a way to so you can play it a bunch and it doesn't like warp and get all shitty like it, it used to. That's why it's thicker. And he was like, "That's stupid." And I was like, "Okay, so like, <laughs> how about you just spend twenty bucks on something and then it like warps after like two or three times of listening to it and you have to like yeah. give it to a tape and then that gets stretched and <laughs> then we go back to CDs and then those breaking tapes." Gets... 
I don't understand the fasc- re-fascination with that. Like, to me, it's like, at least vinyl, like, they fix the problem with it, by all accounts. Yeah. Tape, you can't... How do you fix the problem that there was with tape? You, you can't. Like, you play it a bunch, and, and it's still going to stretch and, and get warped, so... I, mean, I listened to the to the SLM record on cassette. I I think I've listened to it twice because I'm so yeah, paranoid sounds, of it. It sounds weird. Yeah, I'm still paranoid <laughs> of it. Like if I listen to it a few more times, I think I feel I'm so paranoid it's gonna like fuck up. So I just yeah, it's still in my tape player that's on the tent. Like my wife has like one of those old record players where it has a dual cassette. Oh, awesome! So I mean, I I could re I could make a mixtape of it. <laughs> okay, there you go. But regardless. Um, so, uh, we'll end the episode with that. Uh, socials, is there anywhere you want to plug your socials or anything, any dates coming up of anything that you're involved in or? Uh, yes. Shiner is playing in Milwaukee on the 8th of September at Shank Hall okay. and Chicago Worst Fest with the anniversary on the 9th. All right. You should come back to Grand Rapids. Yeah. We should. I don't know how well you like the pre- I know you're a big fan of Twin Peaks, so I figured you would have loved the venue that you guys played at. It was awesome. That was a great... That, I had a great time. It's a good venue. And actually, I felt really self-conscious, and I've been kind of trying to hide it with my head, but... <laughs> oh, hey, look at that. I stole that. Well, it's funny, because my picture is over it. Like, so I didn't even notice it until you pointed it out. <laughs> well, like I said, like I've been trying to like kind of do like one of these, so it's... Like when uh, I was yes. talking with a... Some of the misery signals, dudes. I think my head was like more here because there's <laughs> their poster like right there, and I'm like, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's kind of awkward. That's but, great. No, it'll it would be good. And I mean, Child Bite is a fucking great band. I love those dudes. I'm sure yeah. like potentially Shiner fans are probably like, who the fuck is Child Bite? What is this? What's, yeah, they were. It's funny because we played with, SLM played with those dudes in Kansas City. Oh, that yeah, was how right. I met those guys. Yeah. Um, them and Ken Mode. That was yep. a pretty good show. Yeah, they're um, good dudes. I would. But I would love to see both. Actually, I would love to see those guys come back, and I'd love to see you guys come back. And because I think when you did that show, I was on another vacation, so I didn't even get to go. Yeah. So I want a vacation. Huh? I said I want a vacation. I mean, technically, some would say your life is a vacation. Your job is yes, a vacation. They would. I know it's they not, would. but some would say it is. Yeah, uh, I, I can see that. <laughs> well, I'm not I will, complaining. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> I will uh, let you go to get back to your uh, your early evening, and uh, thank you for the time. Hopefully yeah, your, your mouth is doing better after yesterday's whatever happened. Ugh. Adult. I that's, was like, that's such an adult reason to have to get It really <laughs> is. I felt 150 years old when I sent you that. I was, like, actually, quite, you know. I was like having a speed dinner. And my wife was like, oh, so you're doing this thing? I was like, yeah. Well, actually, no, I guess not. He's got to go get a filling filled. And she was yeah. like, but how old is he? And I go, well, I mean, his, technically, like his nickname is Old Man Josh. So, I mean, it kind of fits. It's on brand, but it is what it is. It definitely was, uh, I felt like an idiot. Yep. Well, thank you for your time, and uh, hopefully yeah, you see you around these parts sooner than later. I hope so, too. Awesome. Thank you very much. All right, man. Bye. Bye. Still, oh, oh, you are still there. Oh, you know the thing. Yep. You know the drill. <laughs> I always forget to ask somebody. They'll be like, hey, like, someone we're done. Like,